Hey, Harp Slingers, welcome to the Harp Slinger Podcast, where each and every week we hang out with the greatest harmonica players in the music business. If you're watching this on the Harp Slinger YouTube page, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ding the bell so we can keep you up to speed on fresh new content. If you're watching this on the Honer Music Facebook page, there's a little share button at the bottom of the chat. Make sure you hit that and share it to your personal profile. We sure would appreciate you guys spreading the word about the Harp Slinger Podcast and Honer Harmonicas. Okay. I would say this every time, but it's true. This It gets better and better every time. My next guest is an American rock and roll icon who sold more than 30 million records worldwide with hits like Heart of Rock and Roll, If This Is It, I Want a New Drug, and The Power of Love. He helped define the MTV era of the 80s and early 90s, generating 19 Billboard Top 10 singles. Here he is, singer, songwriter, producer, actor, and badass harp slinger, <laughs> Huey Lewis. How you doing, Huey? Good. Good, good to be with you. Yeah, it's good to have you here, man. Thank you so much. Where are you right now? Are you out in Montana or are you? Uh... I'm, actually, I'm actually in San Diego at the moment. Okay, all right. It's, You're getting... it's a little cold in Montana for me right now. <laughs> yeah, we're in Nashville, and it's pretty cold for us here too. We got, right. you know, yeah, we got some ice and some snow, which we don't get a lot of. But uh, anyway, yeah, here we are. We kind of hold up between COVID and the and the snow. You know, what can you do? Yeah, you know, you, know you, you, can play, you can play harp, you know. Yeah, you can, you can play harp. That's right, man. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of harp, uh, you know, you're one of uh, Derek and my very favorite harmonica players of all time. And I, I'm very curious, uh, you know, when did you start playing harmonica? What turned you on to the instrument? Uh, well, let's see. Um, I, there was <clears throat> when my, my parents split up when I was like 10 years old and my mother rented a room to a boarder whose name was Billy Roberts, who wrote Hey Joe, actually. Oh, okay. He was a folk singer, and he, had, and he played harmonica with, you know, the, the little On the break. Rack. Yeah. So, and he would give me his old harmonics. And so I just would fool around on the, on the harmonica. Most of them were kind of out of tune, you know, but, <laughs> but they, were, they still made noise, and I played a little bit. And then um, I, I graduated in, uh, from, in high school uh, a year young, because I'd skipped second grade. I was, I, I was, was so good at sandbox in mean, first grade that they just moved me right to third. <laughs> and and, um, and then, uh, so I graduated a year young. I was 16 years old when I graduated from high school. And my old man said, hey, uh, you know, uh, there's only one more thing I'm going to make you do. As far as I'm concerned, your life is your own. But one more thing, I said, what's that? He says, don't go to college. Not yet. I said, what do you mean? I was going to go to Bell. He says, no, no, take a year off and bum around Europe. I insist on it. Wow. So I took the harmonicas and hitchhiked across the country. I got a thing, hitchhiked all throughout and just played music, you know, busked in every, every country in Europe. And uh, wow. when I came back, I went to Cornell for like five minutes over a two year period and just played and danced. I mean, right on, right on. You mentioned you, uh, you growing up and you were in, you grew up in San Francisco, right? Right. Right. So you had the, you know, actually, Marin County, but yeah. Okay. okay, great. So you had access to places like the Fillmore West right. and, uh, and the Winterland Ballroom. I'm sure you saw a lot of great, there was a lot of blues acts that were playing. Yeah, those. Well, yeah. I mean, Butterfield blew my mind. When I saw Butterfield and Fillmore when they, when they had uh, Dave Sanborn and Gene Dinwiddie with the horn section. Uh -huh. I, I, saw, I first saw Butterfield in the East Coast at, at the um, um, oh, dang it, City Hall in New York. Okay. Uh, with Bloomfield and, and uh, Elvin Bishop. Wow. Uh, Jerome Arnold on bass. Okay. Uh, Athlon and uh, Billy Davenport on drums. And uh, that would just wipe me out. You know, I, 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 I was one of the last ones there and I got to sit on the stage, on the side of the stage. Because wow. uh, they, the, they, they added seats or something and it was just fantastic. So that blew my mind. And then, of course, after... after uh, after after prep school, I would I would come home for Christmas and summertime. So we'd go to the Fillmore, and then I saw I saw better the Fillmore with the, with the horn section. That was I, I would you know growing up in San Francisco, we heard a lot of guitar music, tons of guitars, and and the Butterfield band was like guitar relief for a change, you know, with, <laughs> the horn section. And I went, yeah, I kind of like that. It must have made it made a huge impact on you because that's, that's, later that's what started me off. That's fantastic. It must have made a huge impact on you because you, uh, you know, later in life when you had the news, you had a f the full horn section. In fact, yeah. 
I saw you uh, in 84 in Carbondale, Illinois, uh, uh, with uh, you had the Tower of Power horn section, and right. and which was unbelievable. You blew me away that night. That was the first. Uh, that was the first concert I was able to go to without my parents. And <laughs> and uh, yeah, when you played, you you rolled out uh, this this uh, Western Flyer uh, wagon yeah. with, with you know with, with with a drum machine in it, and you guys did Bad Is Bad, and you played harmonica. And I, I think that might have changed my life that moment. I was just <laughs> in awe, you know. Of this amazing harmonica player and singer. I mean, you know, your your vocals are are, uh, you know, Derek and I are both singers too. Derek was a, vo- a voice major in college. In fact, we went to the same college in Illinois. Yeah, uh, really? really? Yeah. yeah, both went to EIU. I was a percussion and voice major there. And uh, Jamie, what, what did you major in? <laughs> Speech communication. But did I you hope- guys, did you guys know each other then? Well, no, I'm a lot younger. Yeah, he likes to point that out. He is actually a lot younger. Than- <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I we, promised him I wasn't going to say that today, but I had to. <laughs> yeah, it always slips out, right, Derek? Yeah, but uh, yeah. So, uh, so you know, hearing your music uh, growing up was sort of the soundtrack, uh, you know, for the '80s for so many people, and uh, and and for me as well. And uh, you know, I just uh, yeah, kind just, of a fu- kind of a function of that time, if you remember, because if you think about it, you know, um, like push button radio was, uh, I mean, um, Top 40, the Top 40 format was created with the advent of push button radio. The, the, the programmer, the, the, somebody opined that when, it, it, now that there was push button radios, if you heard something, if people heard something they didn't like, they could now switch the channel. Mm-hmm. So the idea was narrow your playlist and just play the hits all the time and nobody will leave your channel. And that was Top 40. But now FM radios came as, a, as an alternative to that in the 60s. And they played anything and everything. And that's how Big Brother and the Grateful Dead, and you know, they played just anything they want. But by 70s, FM radio was programmed as well because everybody was listening to stereo. So really, and, and, and then by late 70s, early 80s, the one format that mattered was CHR, Contemporary Hit Radio, which was top 40, the modern term for top 40, but it's actually only like 28 songs. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, were, they, were, they just played the same things over and over again. So if you had a hit, it got, it, it, you know, if you were top five, you got like eight to 10 plays a day on, on, on a radio station, on these big stations. So those are real hit. And coupled with the fact that MTV started up in 1981 and MTV's videos, Th- their playlist exactly mirrored radio and records playlist in the gap room. They watched radio. Remember in the beginning, there was a big hobo. Oh, they're not playing diverse artists or whatever. Uh-huh. But they were just playing radio. So if you had a hit in 1983, you know, a single, 81, 82, 83, 84, there, there just weren't any big hit. There, no bigger hit, you know. I mean, right. everybody heard it all the time. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I, I remember ha- I have your first record uh, and I, I had it. I got it when it came out. So you can sort of do the math and check you're, my you're the one. You're uh, the one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I loved that record. You know, it was uh, it sounded like you guys recorded that like all together in the live room. Right. Uh, it had a lot of a lot of great energy to it, um, which, which we didn't, by the way, which we you didn't. didn't. OK. The sports record was cut piece by piece. And one new drug is cut to a drum machine and, and bad as bad is cut to it. I mean, that's kind of the magic to it is that you hear the drum machine go, dish, dish, mm-hmm. dish, 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 uh, then voices from, from the, the techno lindrum to the voices, you know, so that, yeah. was, that was, that was kind of our angle. And it looks like, it looks like it's just a bar band record, but it's not. I mean, all that uh, dr- new drug, harder rock and roll, and and uh, walking on a thin line are all cut to machines. The the base base part on new drug dunk, 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 is all programmed, and uh, we and the way we did that, we had no idea how to do. It. We were producing our own record, and we're in the record plant. And next door in the studio was um, Peter Wolf, the Austrian producer uh-huh. and and techno master, and he was doing. Um, uh, the Starships record, I think, or somebody, and I go into that studio and they're wow, that's you know, it's just sound like modern. So I, I on a break, I said to Peter, I said, Peter, can you with that? Can you? And he came in and programmed our machines for us and showed us how to do it. 
Wow. And so the, our, our angle on that was that we cut those with, with, with the drum machine and then all the fills were, were, were human. We, you know, we overdubbed toms and snares and uh, toms and cymbal crashes and hi-hat and stuff. Right on. What, what, uh, what was the precipitous for you to decide you were going to produce your own record? Well, really good question. Very good question. Um, because, you know, it wasn't done in the 80s. You just didn't, they didn't, these right. guys, didn't, they didn't allow bands to produce their own record. Uh, our first record was produced by Bill Schnee and sold like nine copies. And so then we, were, <laughs> then we were going to go look for another producer and we, we um, auditioned, auditioned or cut, did sessions with these guys. And, and I, you know, by this point, I was no spring chicken. I was already 30 or so. I'd cut records with Mutt Langer and, uh, in England and stuff. So I knew my way around the studio a little bit, and so did my guys. So we, we convinced our manager that we could do it. And he convinced our label, because our label was in England. It was a Chrysalis Records, and, mm-hmm. you know, 6,000 miles away. And they couldn't really control us. So they let us produce our own record. And... Um, it was, that was very important because we knew, uh, again, think of the time, it's, it's the 80s now, in the early 80s, and CHR format is all that matters. If you don't have a hit record, there's no internet, there's no jam band, there's no other scene other than Top 40 where you need a hit record. And so um, we knew we were going to have to be, you know, make a commercial record, and we wanted to make those choices ourselves. We didn't want, you know, because we knew if we had a hit, we were going to have to live with it. And so... Mm-hmm. That, that's that's that was the main reason for doing it and uh and and in fact then we we, we produced picture this ourselves the, the second album where we had do believe in love which is kind of a tickle and then on the next record we aimed everything right at radio uh, because we needed a hit. it was our third album and if we didn't have a hit the label would have dropped us and that would have been it you know so we sports the sports record really is a collection of singles it's a record of its time it's a collection of singles that one doesn't sound anything like the other because I didn't want to repeat ourselves. I figured here, here, we need a hit, you know, here's, here's a, here's a rocker, here's a ballad, here's a, you know, and, and like that, hoping, sure. hoping one of them would stick. Honestly, yeah. we didn't know we were going to have five hits. We, we needed, we knew we needed one. Yeah. It's like every song on that though, it could be a hit. It's like one of the greatest records of all time. Oh, I think. Totally. And before that, Jamie and I were talking about that, but one of the things that we were talking about when we were talking about you and your harmonica playing is like, I come from right on the Mississippi river in Illinois. There was blues people coming through all the time and everybody played a harmonica. And a lot of times it wasn't very great. So it was just beating your face. Now me working for Honer and being a guy that has to hear harmonica a lot. I love when people use it sparingly. And I know you've mentioned that before. So when Jamie and I were talking, I was like, man, Huey just has some of the best tone, and he just knows where to place notes. You don't, you're a great player, but you don't have to overplay. How does that factor into your writing and what you do? When, when people know you as a harp player, too, but you don't use it a ton. Like, right. well, how does that affect you? That's a really, it's a really good point. I mean, it's a really great point. And, uh, you know, and, and har, har, the harmonica is maybe the most expressive instrument and really in the world in a way when you bend note i mean and every and it it adopts as you guys know the sound of your own body so no two guys sound alike in the harmony it's very individual and it's super expressive but but it's so expressive it's almost like a guy yelling at you you know what i mean you don't want a guy yelling at you 24 7 you know yell at me a little bit and then go away exactly. and so because it's it's that it's that compelling that sound it's that it's that compelling so and the other one is the sound you know we all i mean walter and sonny boy you know sort of wrote the book and everybody and there's a there's so many great harmonica players out there guys who play walter note for note and got in all that stuff and i i just tried to find a a, a niche, you know, where I could, where I could find a, a, a sound and a, and a style that would be, you know, s- sort of original, you know, a little bit different that way. And so I think that's what we all try to do. You know, we all, you all try to find your, uh, a style. And so, and, and so, so to that end, and, and, and also the, the thing I had in my band is I had great soloists in my band too. So I have to consider that I got to let the guitar player have a solo every once in a while. Right. Mm-hmm. I got to get the sax player a solo. So, yeah. um, so I didn't, you know, I probably, I didn't play on every song, you know, I, and, and I'm fine with that. You know? Yeah. And I think that's what made it so powerful when you did play it. It's because just because you can, doesn't mean you should. 
And, and I think you're, you're the well, that's true. of that. And you know, it's, it's the notes you don't play, right? I mean, it really is. It's, it's the notes you don't play in the space and mm-hmm. the, the notes that you choose and, and, and all that. It's, you know, there's all, it's, it's style. Is all. Right on. Yeah. I, I, you know, as I, I get all of that, but for me, I could hear you play harmonica like on every tune, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, and those solos are sort of, uh, you know, those solos are well known. People can sing those solos, those harp solos that you played. I mean, were, the, were those things that you worked out before you went into the studio or were those song were those just that was a take? Let me give you another pass of something different. How did you put those together? Just like that. Just like that. We just play them and then try another one. And I yeah. like that one. And if there's a goof, then we fix it and whatever. Just like that. No, no biggie. You know, interestingly, uh, on the sports record, which was assembled piece by piece, as I said, uh, for the most part, I mean, there, once in a while there were a couple guys in the room and so on, but we've made records all kinds of ways. And uh, subsequent records, um, Plan B, uh, Soulsville, we, we, we made a tribute record uh, uh, to Ma- uh, Memphis, you know, Stax, sure. Stax uh, Muscle Shoals tribute record mm-hmm. and cut it in Memphis and we cut it completely live with the horn section you see we had the advantage of having heard these songs and so we, we could rehearse them and with the and we had the horn section so we could write the charts and get and and you know when the original songs were cut like Sam and Dave tunes they mm-hmm. didn't have the horn section yet they cut they get the rhythm section the boys sang it then they bring in the horns so the rhythm section doesn't know where the horn charts are uh-huh. but we had the advantage of hearing that ahead of time so we know everything. So so we worked it out perfectly. We rehearsed it. And then we went in and literally just captured it in Memphis with two studios, the horn section in one and six of us in another and me in a vocal booth. And four of those tunes are completely live with no overdubs uh, oh. and, no, and no fixes. And it was, uh, but you know, and I, pre- I kind of prefer this way more fun to way to make records. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, I like it. I prefer it. But, but, if you're going to have a hit record, you know, you're, you, unfortunately, it's, it's going to be played over and over and over again. And so you don't want any flaws on it and you got to, so there's almost a reason to, to make it sterile and use machines and all that. It's, it's almost a technological reason for that, you know, and today you don't hear, I mean, other than throwback stuff, like in country, you hear that now, the new modern, uh, new country guys like, uh, you know, Chris Stapleton and, Sturgill Simpson, these guys, they just turn the mics on, cut like we used to cut back in the day. So yeah, it, both it's books. kind of interesting. Absolutely. Let's talk about your songwriting for a minute. When did you start writing? I mean, your songwriting, your lyrics are, are you know, amazing lyrics. Uh, it's something that, you know, as a writer, you develop over the years, but it seemed like you were writing these amazing songs right from the very beginning. Uh, do you write all the time? Are you one of those guys that, that writes nearly every day or... No, no, no. I, don't, I don't. It right just on. comes to me when it comes to me, and yeah. and, and it used to come. And, and it's harder when you get, you know, when you've written. The, like I got, we wrote the heart of rock and roll. So now, now what? You can't write another song with rock and roll in the title, can you? I mean, <laughs> you know, the more you write, the less you have. You know? <laughs> yeah. Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Fry was a buddy of mine, and uh, we we were playing golf one time and being interviewed by this guy, and this uh, by a, a sports writer at the, at the Pebble Beach deal. And the sports writer said, man, between you guys, you must have written zillions of songs. <laughs> I said, well, I haven't. I've, I've used pretty much everything I wrote. And Glenn says, me too. He says, I use every single thing. He says, you're kidding me. I thought you wrote zillions. He says, nope, nope. He says, and, and by the way, he says, show me somebody who's written a hundred songs. I'll show you 95 pieces of shit. He <laughs> says, if you write five songs in your life that mean something, he says, <laughs> that's, that's the Hall of Fame stuff. And he's actually right about that. You know, I mean, you, you can write a lot of songs, but if you get into a reset, we're going to write, you and I are going to write a song, Jamie. We go get in, the, you get in a room and we bang out a song. Odds of it being a really great one are, are rare. I mean, the muse has to come to you. She has to come and say, boom, there's your gift. Now, you, now, you, now you're good, you know, so yeah. that's what. Speaking of muses, you were, uh, you were recently on, on the blacklist, which I watched, which was awesome to see you on tv again and uh you, you were supposedly the muse of uh, this character who had passed away and 
you were supposed to go to the DMV. <laughs> I thought it was really great. You did a great job in it, and I love your acting. Uh, big fan of duets. Your your duet with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was was amazing. Uh, do you have any any uh, more acting uh, things on the uh, on the horizon for you? I got a couple things going on actually. Not, nothing that I can announce, you know. But but uh, but I you know I'm in show business, so I'll do anything for attention or money. <laughs> <laughs> right in that order. Uh, and, and I find it, you know, and, you know, I lost my hearing three years ago, so I can't, I still can't hear pitch, right? I, uh -huh. I'm actually having a really good day today, to be, to be honest. It fluctuates it, episodically, very uh -huh. strangely. I, I'll go for 10 days where I can't hear anything. And then I'll get a week where I'm better and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good today. But uh, it's difficult to explain. It's not, not a lot of fun to talk about. But what happens is music is you know, a hundred times harder to listen to than speech. Speech occurs at a frequency. If you get the, you know, 11 to 1500 cycles, and like I wear, I have two hearing aids in the Bluetooth to my thing. That's how come I can hear you now. Okay. But they're tweaked to the, they're very brittle, if you know what I mean. Uh -huh. So when, when, when you hear music, oh my God, it's cacophony. It goes, <laughs> I can't hear pitch or find out anything. If I take these out, I'm better. But I can't now. I can't hardly hear, so uh -huh. it's 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 really a it's I have and I, I can't play with the band because it's level is the devil. As soon as it gets loud, and we got a PA system or something like that, oh my god, I can't I can't find pitch and it's 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 horrible. So, you know, I, I try to stay busy somehow, stay creative, and we have a musical that we've been working on. I got to throw myself into that. Um, that we're, we're waiting for Broadway to open up. Hopefully, get a theater in Broadway, and I got. Uh, a documentary that's being made and I got uh, another television show that I'm flirting with and you know different stuff trying to trying to stay creative and, and busy because you know I mean uh, you know I miss the miss the music thing because I miss the guys right I mean that's mm -hmm. that's the, it, I don't mind not being on the bus and traveling every day for you know six weeks at a time yeah sure but I do, but I do miss the guys you know so yeah I bet are most of the guys uh, still in the San Francisco area? Yeah, they're well. They are. Let's see. Uh, L.A. couple in couple in L.A. couple in San Francisco. Most in San Francisco. One in Minneapolis, and one in. That's it. Okay, right that's on. <laughs> and me, I'm in Montana. And you in Montana? Yeah, getting away from it all. That sounds great. You're on a ranch out there, right? Yeah, more cheese, less rats. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you say why Montana? I said more cheese was red. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's great. Uh, I I noticed that you uh you were a fan a fan of and a friend of uh Phil Lynott yeah, from Thin Lizzy, Thin Lizzy, and uh, I was I was curious if you could talk about how that friendship came about and uh, he he played a pretty pretty significant role I. For you right in your life as a as a performer and uh an entertainer yeah and a, and a mentor really he, he was he taught me so much uh, you know when i first met him we i was in a band called clover before this mm -hmm. we got signed uh uh by um J uh, jake Riviera and dave robinson who started stiff records right after they signed <laughs> us <laughs> that was that was a good move uh <laughs> but we uh this is probably 76 77 Huh. In, in London, and we we moved to London. And when our first tour, we supported Thin Lizzy. We were called Support. It was Thin Lizzy plus Support, and we got <laughs> we got pretty much booed off every stage. Uh, stuff uh, you know, booed and stuff thrown at, at every show. Wow! I remember the first show was in Oxford, it was just north of London, mm -hmm. and we were told we wouldn't get a sound check. Because you don't, British bands, you just don't get sound checks till maybe halfway through the tour or whatever. We said, okay, whatever. So the curtain's down. We're playing these little theaters, you know, um, what, 3,000 seaters maybe, something like that. And um, and the curtain's down. And outside, as we're setting up our amps and trying to get tones and all that stuff, <laughs> you can hear outside, they're going, let's say, Lizzie. And now the curtain goes up to that, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and there's there's us, and and we're no nobody doesn't know who we are. They don't even they have no clue. And so, 
you know, we would just get junk thrown at us and food. We, we, would, we learned to play our songs so no time between tunes. We'd go from song to song to song because dead air was just, you know, a killer, terrible, dangerous. So, we were, in our first show, we run through all these songs. We finally get through, the, and I, run, I mean, it's all we could do to get, get through all the songs without, you know, getting trashed. I went, run off, get off the side of the stage, just waiting in the wings is Philip, and he says, "Can I have a word with you? Can I have a word with you, Huey?" I said, "Sure." He says, "Comes in, and he proceeds to to mentor me and tell me about his audience and what songs he thinks we should play and what." Boom. And it started from there. And he took, then I, I sat in with him every night and he just kind of took me under his wing and taught me not, not so much musically, but how to run a band, how to talk to the press, how to talk to fans, how to talk to your crew, how to keep the, you know, he, he loved being a star. He was, and he was just a wonderful, wonderful guy, big heart and just fun, just loves and, and was just a, a great, great rock star, you know, Philip Leonard. And on stage, live on stage, nobody could touch him. Best, best live performer I've ever seen. Wow, fantastic. And that's, a, that's sort of a weird pairing, actually. Clover, if correct me if I'm wrong, I think Clover was kind of a country, country rock band, right? Yeah. You said it. Kind yeah. of a weird pairing. But we were on phonogram, and they were on phonogram. So, it, you yeah. know, that, they figured it, it would help somehow. It didn't, you know, we just got, you know, but yeah. Now, speaking of country music, you also did, um, you played on the, the long train running uh, thing with, with Toby Keith, right? That's right. And so how did that come about and how is it that you're the heart player on that? Well, uh, 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 McPhee, uh -huh. I think probably on that, you know, John McPhee plays with the Doobies. Yeah. He has for 30 years now, I guess, probably, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I, I, I remember we, we were in a band, Clover, with, McPhee was in Clover with me, yeah. and uh, and Alex Call and John Chambodi and, and um, Mickey Shine and uh, and Sean Hopper, our keyboard player. Uh, but um, yeah, so um, what was the question? I'm sorry, I lost my mind. <laughs> yeah, how did it, how did it come about that uh, you're you're the harp player on that tune? Oh, so when they redid, I, but I've known the Doobies forever because they're from our area and. Their manager Bruce Cohn's a pal of ours, and so on. So they just asked me to do it. You know, I I McPhee was in Clover, and before I joined Clover, I was a kind of a blues snob, black music blues snob. And when I joined Clover, uh, McPhee turned me on to Charlie McCoy, and yeah. and and uh, and and, I, and I, it just changed. You know, opened up a whole new room for mm -hmm. me. You know, and uh, so I I learned a lot of stuff from. Clover that way, playing, you know, playing that style. Yeah. And, uh, and so what happened was when they did this rebound thing, McPhee just called me and said, how about you playing the harmonica? Yeah. <laughs> so, Jamie, you have a tie there too, don't you? Yeah, yeah. actually, John McPhee played uh, played pedal steel on my band's last record. Excellent. And he's he's fantastic. He can play he's anything. Unbelievable. He's great. And he plays everything, right? I mean, yeah, he plays it all well, yeah. He plays Fiddle, it all well. Yeah. Yeah, he put strings on it. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. and he's the sweetest guy on the planet. I mean, he's just such a wonderful guy. Yeah, he was very, very gracious. I would say that for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I felt like it was in royal, you know, royalty. He's we have a song on our new record uh, called uh, "One of the Boys" that um, I originally, uh, you know, I had a, I had a meeting with, with with Dave Cobb, the producer, mm -hmm. brilliant producer, and he he um, we had a nice little lunch meeting. There in Nashville, actually, and he um, he said, "I think I'm going to get a gig uh, producing Willie Nelson. I wonder if you'd like to try and write a song for Willie." I said, "Me write a song for Willie Nelson?" And then I, I was so I was so happy that he even asked me. You know, I thought, like, "Wow, that was great." I, I said, "Well, gee, thanks. I don't think I can, but I'll give it a think." And then then I actually had this idea for this song. Oddly enough, weeks down the road. And and cut it, and then um, and sent it to him, and he loved it, but he didn't get the gig. So um, our drummer Bill Gibson said, "I think we should do it." I said, "Well, yeah, well, it's country, Bill." He, he says, "So what?" I said, "It sounds good." So so we put it on our record, and I sent it to McPhee, and McPhee just killed it on steel. And I and I explained to him what I wanted. I, you know, I didn't want that jazzy 
steel thing. I, but I don't want lap steel either. Right. I want I want it right in there. And he knew he's a collector. He's got he's got a bunch of steels. I mean, all kinds of different guitars and stuff. And he knew exactly what 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 the instrument. He told me I can't remember even what, what what he used, but he just laid it right in there somewhere somewhere between Hank Williams and Bakersfield. You know, it's just yeah. real good. But McPhee's a, a treasure, uh, really. Yeah, he is a treasure. And, you know, you've, you've done a few tunes that are uh, sort of could be considered country, right? I mean, you, you, did, the, uh, you did the Hank Williams uh, song that was uh, fantastic. Uh, yeah. And, and this I, song- I love country music. I, I'm, I'm, not so, I'm not so enamored of modern country, if you know what I mean. I, mm-hmm. I, I like traditional country music. Um, you know, I like Alan Jackson a lot. I like George Strait a lot. I mean, yeah. I really do. And uh, I think George Strait's fantastic. He's like the Frank Sinatra of country music. He's got that crooner voice, and and he he wears it so well. George does it for me. He yeah. just wears it so well. He's just self-effacing, just good guy. Mm-hmm. Here's my music, man. I and mean, he he's, he's not you know not tweeting about his right you know, having for breakfast or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he would know what <laughs> tweeting is if you if he didn't I, know. I don't I don't I don't tweet. <laughs> but you do have a radio show uh, that you're doing, the the yeah. 80s radio show on, on Apple, which uh, I don't have Apple at the moment, so I haven't been able to check it out, but I'm dying to check it out. Is it, So it's a radio show. You're, you're, you're the host. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm the host, and I, I even have a few guests. I'm taking a page out of your book. I, have, um, I, I had David Foster as a guest. He was fantastic. Yeah. I had uh, 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 Jane Whedon from the Go-Go's. We talked about... The Go Go's were, were really fun on the show. They, you know, they're interesting. I always loved the Go Go's, and I didn't know why. You know, I just don't know why I like the Go Go's. And then I did this little interview, and I said, "Oh man, that's why I like the Go. They're a real rock band. The yeah. They're just a real rock band. You know." Yeah, they're fantastic too. Um, but I, I love that. It's a way to the 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 uh, the podcast has been really fun. I, I wasn't sure, but but I I really am enjoying it, and and, it, and it's fun to point out things about you know the 80s because hits like we just like we talked about uh, our, our show's called huey's 80s radio uh-huh. and, and you know the hits in those times were just so pervasive i mean th- those hits were huge you think about the records that were sold i mean what you know we sold 10 million records but so did whitney houston bruce springsteen madonna i mean all of us were selling millions of records mm-hmm. unbelievable yeah. I mean, when sports came out, you there was a lot of competition for those 28 spots on the radio. I mean, the, right. the albums you Thriller. just listed, Thriller, Born, Born in the USA. USA, yeah, lots of great stuff. Uh, and, and you know, somehow uh, you're, you are the, when people think of uh, the 80s, I think everyone thinks of Huey Lewis. I mean, you are sort of synonymous with, with that time period and for, for great reason, right? I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind. I don't mind. You know, people, I never thought we were an '80s band, to be honest with you. I don't think we. I mean, I think the Flock of Seagulls were an '80s band, kind of. You know, I see your point. I see your point. Yeah, you were drawing I, I, on different influences for sure. Whatever, but but I don't care. You know, I I'm not afraid. Our stuff is pop music. You know, it's mm-hmm. popular music. I mean, it's not jazz and it's not classical. It's music is a part of what we do, but it's only mm-hmm. a part of what we do. Our, our thing is really communication. It's cultural. You know, it's, these are sounding boards for the people and so on. It's just like food. You know, there's, there's foie gras and then there's hamburgers, you know, and, uh, and we're doing hamburgers over here. You know, that's, uh, that's where we're at. <laughs> but, uh, no, with, with that, I, I, don't, I don't make any apologies for that. That's, a, you know, we just make a good hamburger. Yeah. You do, man. <laughs> at, since you have like the film career and, and you like doing the acting thing, but since, you know, you have one of the most iconic soundtracks of all time for any movie ever made. And how does that play into your stuff? Like, was the movie well, first? Was the music first? Like, how, how did that come about? Yeah, well, um, what do you mean? The, the soundtrack of... Back to the Future. Back to the Future, oh, yeah. Uh, well, that, that happened. Uh, Bob Zeme- uh, let's see, Steven Spielberg, Bob Zemeckis... Bob Gale, who, whose story it kind of is, and, and Neil Cannon, who, you know, produced, directed, and wrote the film, mm-hmm. asked to take a meeting with us in Amblin. Amblin was brand new. And we uh, took a meeting, and they said, we'd just written this film, and 
their lead our lead character is a guy called Marty McFly, and he and and Huey Lewis in the News would be his favorite band. So, do you want to you know if you write a song for the film? I said, wow, you know, flattered. Didn't know how to write for film necessarily. You know, never really written for film, uh -huh. and Frank and honestly didn't fancy writing a song called Back to the Future. <laughs> and they said, oh, no problem. We, right? Just we, all we care is whatever, one of your songs. So mm -hmm. the next song we wrote was Power Love. Or, or, or that's kind of how I remember. Zemeckis remembers that I sent him the song Power Love and he thought it was too, it wasn't up enough, he told me. So then I guess what I did is, because, you know, it's in a minor key. The verse is in a minor key. The ver the 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 chorus is in a major key but, and so because it started off as a minor key this minor key group and he, he and i said oh, okay so then i told the boys and somebody got an idea and i think it was johnny came up with bam, 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 that the in, the intro section and and he loved that so that, that that's how that happened yeah, no, that's so cool now since you said, you know, you guys are a pop band and that's your thing, you use a lot of like chord progressions and changes that are not typical of a lot of pop music though. That's and true. How do you slide those in there with still getting, you know, that big radio stuff? And that's, that, you know, you, you just said a mouthful right there. That, that is the exercise. The exercise is to get, get it, is to reinvent the wheel, but somehow reinvent it so that it's original enough so that, so that, you know, that, so it's meaningful to you. You know, you don't want to copy. You got you got to have to do something. So you got to find a way to, and, and usually it's, it's hybridizing musical styles, I think. is You know, you take early R&B stuff and put it with techno click track or something, or what, just some, trying some, find a way to make, to, to write original stuff, you know, and, um, but you are, in fact, trying to, you're quite right, and, and, and uh, that's one thing you have to guard against, because if you write, you know, you got too many, you, you write a song, it's got a bunch of chords in it, a bunch of big chords in it, and so suddenly it's not rock and roll anymore, right, it's, it's a nice song, but it's, but it's not rock and roll, so, you know, it, it's a difficult little balancing act, but um, good point. Yeah, and I, I think that's what makes your music so timeless, is that you can have a lot of people that might have a sound that they're trying to go after that is like yours, but no one sounds like you. And mm -hmm. and that's with your music, your progressions, and how you did it, but all and your heart playing and your voice. And I think that's just so incredible that we don't really have a lot of anymore. And, and, it's, and it's also comes from where us being a real band or we're, we're a, Chris Hayes, our guitar player is a wonderful jazz player, was a wonderful jazz player and knows all kinds of chords, you know, that we don't use, you know? So, <laughs> and so some of that stuff comes from the band and, and most, a lot does. And, and you know, that's how we do things. And, and uh, I, I, I've always, I've always maintained that this kind of music, you know, popular music is the important part is to find, you know, band music as well as we play. It's a synergistic thing, you know, and when it happens, boy, we're, we're much bit greater than the, the sum of the parts is much greater than the addition of the individual things. And that's the object. And in order to do that, you have to, you know, you have to be, you know each other well and be really honest about it. And, and, but, but I think if, if you do, and you're careful about it, you, you, you can, you can, you can write and perform better than 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 a guy who's maybe more talented and gonna maybe a quicker study because we don't need quick studies. This is not brain surgery here. You know, this is popular music. We learn it, and the idea is to get better and better and better and keep working on it. And uh, and, and that's what we did as a band. I mean, the unfortunate thing when I lost my hearing is that we actually were still improving as a band. You know, yeah. after all those. After so many years, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right on. And the new weather, uh, the weather album is great. I think so. I think it's some of our best work. I really do. I've been saying that, but I, I really think it is. Yeah, must have been a good time to 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 make that record. It's like uh, I love the idea of you know sports for weather. It's like you're reading the newspaper. You know, <laughs> very yeah. clever, very clever. I love well, we, the trouble. You know, we only had seven. There's only seven songs on this album because mm -hmm. we were just slowly compiling as we went along. We, you know, you got to have the idea. Like I said, the muse has to go. Here's your song. So we had 
seven night seven songs cut we were cutting them sort of over the last you know 10 years or more even maybe 15 years and we had them in the can for the most part and then uh, my hearing collapsed so we waited a kind of a year to see if i could sing again and it didn't get any better so we figured let's release the record you know mm. we did just before it was released just before covid but they're going to work it again i think now so hope so that's I come from a re- most recently a, a, a harmony band, so you know when I you know you know I listen to Huey Lewis in the news, it's got these most. You have a band full of lead singers. It seems like guys who can really sing and hold a part. Who, True, who, especially Johnny. Johnny's a really good singer, and and Bill can sing really well. You know our drummer Bill Gibson mm-hmm. is not just a drummer; he's a great musician. He's a singer and he plays piano, and you know. So my, I got a band full of good players and good singers and. Yeah. Credit goes to them for that. Johnny's our major vocal arranger, but we we all sing. Um, you know, um, and Chris sang, and yeah, we all sing, and that's an advantage. And Sean, our keyboard player, sings bass, but he's not really a bass singer, but but he's a baritone, but he sings bass on our stuff. So we have a little bit of a trouble because you know we don't have a real high singer and we don't have a real bass singer. We're all kind of right in here. So yeah. We, we have to, uh, every song we do, it's, it's too low for somebody and too high for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, 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 you need Jamie now. So next time you guys have to do anything, you just call him. He's now, the guy I'll, that can do it all. Well, I'll sing some low stuff for you. But <laughs> bass baritone, sure. Yeah, man. Um, oh, I just lost my, my train of thought. I'm so sorry. I derailed you. I, I, it's what I do, though. That's, that's my job is to derail you a little bit. You play Danica harmonicas, right? Yeah. Do you, yeah. Play do you know Tony? I do know Tony. Yeah. Guy. I have one right here, actually. I love those. I love those harps. That, that Optimus is. It's, that's, I know. It sounds amazing. I have one here that's country tuning. It's fantastic. I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, I, I, think, I think a wooden, an uh, old wooden Marine band, you know, they were t- terribly inconsistent, the old Marine band. You know, you get one. And that, but you get a good one that doesn't swell and just, and man, not only would, would the action be good, you get one with, with good act, the tone, I think the tone is best. The wooden comb is the is best tone, I think. Uh, a friend of my wife and I uh, is, is choreographing your show. Lauren, Lauren, Lutero, Lauren Lutero? Yeah, yeah. She, she's fantastic. She's fantastic, I know. How do she, you know her? My wife did a lot of Broadway shows. She was in Phantom of the Opera, Swing, The Red Shoes, a bunch of that stuff. And uh, so she's in that she's in that Broadway crowd. And uh, Lauren's fantastic. I went to Lauren's first wedding. Did you really? <laughs> it was like a million dollar wedding. There was she like got a, married. Well, she got married two years ago, I think, to the doctor. Right? She's got a new kid. She yeah. She's so this was uh she, this was uh back in two thousand maybe two thousand one or something when she was married before. Oh, what a small yeah. world, right? Yeah, it's a small world. The thing that's so neat about the musical, you know, is first of all, because my hearing collapsed, we got, I had to cancel all my shows. What am I going to do? Was as it happened, that was perfect timing for our musical, which we put up in San Diego, and I was able to be there every day. And the fascinating part is that, you know, it's, it's an original story uh, based on our music. Uh, so all the songs are Huey Lewis and the new songs. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the musical director is a guy called uh, Brian Yusufer, who's brilliant. He did Frozen and mm-hmm. Kinky Boots, and, and he's just brilliant. And he gives each song a unique setting, and pretty much when, when we zigged, he zags, you know. So, I mean, the female characters sing, hit me like a hammer. So, the female, so things change, you know. And he mm-hmm. gave them wonderful and, and different arrangements, and just really neat stuff. But what's really amazing about it for me is that you watch this show and they're all of our songs. They're sung, you know, sung by completely different people and different arrangements. That, but there's a thread that goes through there. You know, it's weird. And, and, and I don't even notice it. And when, when you write, you don't notice it much. But suddenly you realize, wow, you know, there's a lot of workings. There's a lot of heart. There's a lot of love. There's a lot mm-hmm. of power. There's a lot of, these words just keep coming up in my, it, you know, it, it's very interesting. And when you hear it all as a body of work, you go, oh my gosh, you know, wow, I do have a little bit of a style. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of bit of a style, man, a in, in the it's, best it's, way. 
But it, it's a really neat thing to experience songs that you wrote handled in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. It's really cool, you know, given, given a completely different setting. And you go, wow. And it, it's, 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 it's like a song. It's really neat. Yeah. Who, who wrote the book for that uh, musical? Uh, a guy called John Abrams. Okay. And, and, uh, and uh, with story help from Tyler Mitchell, our producer. Okay. All right. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. Does a character, I mean, a character that's really good and it's really fun. We did six weeks in San Diego and it sold out every show, got nice. good reviews and, and we were waiting on Broadway and then COVID hit. Fortunately, we didn't get a theater. Mm -hmm. or right. Dead water. Now we got to wait. And, but, you know, Hunter Arnold and Tom Corday here, we've partnered up with them and they're, they produce probably 75% of the musicals on Broadway. So, and they're very bullish. Our show's not, it's not edgy, you know, it's not edgy. It's, it's fun actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think they're really happy about a fun show at this mm -hmm. time. Yeah. As opposed to an edgy show when, right. when times were good, you know? Exactly. I mean, and so that, that we're, we're kind of excited about it. We hope, we hope it'll work. Right. I can't wait to see it. And as you know, it's not enough to get a show up on Broadway. You got to have a hit. Yeah. You, yeah. you can get your show all the way to Broadway and run six months and still lose your money. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, man, it's such a such a venture. That yeah. There's so much money goes involved. But my wife tells this great story about when she was in the Red Shoes on Broadway. They went through previews for a month, a month of previews, if you can imagine that. And then opening night, they're all. it's like the movie scene where everyone goes to Sardi's for opening night they're waiting waiting until the paper comes out for the review and it got a bad review and she said everyone just left it was just, that was it the next day it was it was it was over yeah all sure. of that well you know the critics still matter a lot of course in broadway but they don't matter as much as they used to there are, there's a now now there are some shows that have had C reviews, not terrible reviews. Mm -hmm. You know, Buffett's show got killed, right? You saw yeah. that. I mean, mm -hmm. and so that if, if you get a if you get an F review, you're dead. You just mm -hmm. forget about it. But right. but you don't need a a, a rave anymore. Uh, I mean, Memphis, uh, 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 Motown. Uh, these shows didn't get great reviews, but still did business and still made money. Won't ran for you. So I, it's a little better off now. But you know. It, it, it is a problem. Yeah. It's a problem. You got to, you, you know, and, and see, the fun thing is, is the interesting part is for most of us, for everybody who doesn't go to Broadway shows very often, almost every Broadway show is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. and really, I mean, the talent on that stage is amazing. Oh, These yeah. people can sing and dance and act and do anything. I mean, they're just so talented. It's unbelievable. And so you look at the show, you go, wow, that was great. And then somebody pans, you say, how do they pan that show? Well, you know, every show has great dancers and great singing and great things. So they're used to that. Mm -hmm. so you gotta, it's, it's the little intangibles that you got to get, you know, for the, for, to get the good reviews, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Huey, thank you so much. for It looks like our time is up, but we don't want to keep you all day. We're so no, grateful no. that you did this show with us. Uh, on behalf of Derek and myself, uh, Huey Lewis... We're not worthy. <laughs> We're not worthy. Thank you so much for your time, man. And Happy to be with you, man. Thanks yeah, a lot. Good luck with the musical and everything else you've got going on. And I can't wait to see you uh, on the big screen again soon. Thanks a lot. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so um, much. Take care, man. Bye-bye.